When you study, if you study events in an interconnected fashion by linking each event to the other, it will help you in memorizing easily, keeping, getting a better understanding of information and also if you bring in dates and timeline, it will help you in keeping the chronology as well. Hello everyone, welcome to Crossroads, an initiative by Clear Eyes, where you will be studying important events in an interlinked fashion. I am Honey Matthew, an educator at Clear Eyes. So before we move on, let me give you a quick introduction about this program. This is an initiative in a different direction that can help you in memorizing important events chronologically and to get a better idea about your basic subject and the current affairs. And in this video, you will get to see the following things. We will have, a, we will have an analysis of a time period. This time period may span somewhere between 10 to 15 years. And we will have a quick glance at all the important events that had happened during that time period. This will cover all important events related to Indian history, world history, Indian economy, world economy, international events, polity and administration and everything under the sun. <laughs> Sorry, I cannot do that. But yeah, we'll be covering at least few of the important events that we need to really remember. Then towards the end, we may discuss about any of those topics that need a little deeper information considering the prelims and mains angle. So the benefits of this video, if you watch till the end and if you're patient enough, is uh, that um, you will be able to remember the chronology of important events. And it's not just related to India, but also the other worlds, other parts of the world. And in this way, you can kind of, you know, get an overall view about a particular time period and events happening during that time. You can also link it to other parallel events that had happened during that time. Um, uh, this will help you in memorizing important topics for the UPSC in a better way. And also, you can relate these studies with the current studies that you're doing right now. So you get a background information and a whole picture about what was happening when, okay? So, for example, if I can say that, you know, while we were struggling for independence in 1945, here in India when cabinet mission was coming uh, and, uh, you know, things were happening, uh, we can say that parallelly there was this Indonesian uh, war for freedom and uh, Vietnam's war for freedom happening, you know, some something like that. You would be connecting things in parallel worlds, okay? Yeah, I'm speaking Greek, I guess. So because you may not be able to understand what it is in a clear fashion i think let's get into the video and once we are done with the video you'll get a better understanding of what this whole initiative is all about so let's get going so before i start let me tell you that the period that i have uh, started he uh, taken here as reference point is the period after the second world war the reason is as you know, the Second World War was in itself considered as one of the greatest event that could happen in the, in you know the world history, which kind of changed most of the things in its current form. Okay, so we'll start about a, we'll talk about a world after the World War. After the Second World War, the world saw a major shift in economic, administrative, political, social, and cultural sphere and many movements and phenomenon that change the face of the current world are attributed to this period. So I chose this period because most of you are well aware about this period and we do refer it in different current affairs and basic studies. So we'll start with this period itself, okay? So the different phenomena that we are kind of <clears throat> well acquainted with is the Cold War phenomenon, the, the period of postmodernism, the period of decolonization. It was this was the period which was marked with increase in consumerism. You know, after the Second World War, production and everything rose up, and then this um, um, the idea, the concept of welfare state. Of course, the space race where everybody, you know, most of the countries wanted to put someone or the other in in the space, whether it be dog or a man or whatever. But yes, U.S. and U.S.S.R. were really serious in this race. And uh, the non-aligned movement, the import substitution phenomenon, and the counterculture of the 1960s, opposition to the Vietnam War, which happened in USA, the civil rights movement, 
the sexual revolution you know people had started to talk about individuality their individual rights and all my body my right kind of stuffs and all and the beginning of second wave of feminism well the first wave uh, if i remember well it was somewhere in between 19th 19th century 20th century like 1859 to 1940 somewhere around where you know women were claiming for voting vote rights and all that kind of thing and yes the nuclear arms race well it was clear when hiroshima and nagasaki was bombed that yes nuclear energy has entered the forefront okay so we'll start with the period 1945 and we'll be covering till 1960 so what was that all about the world after the world war is you know very popularly quoted as year 0 and to tell you why because this was the year when uh, a new beginning in the history of freedom of the earth can be related to um the world was divided into two powers known as us and ussr and the cold war had begun and these two superpowers were dominating the world and two different ideologies communism and capitalism had emerged as one of the like you know few of the strongest ideologies during that time the competition was on and meanwhile they were fighting heads on heels we can say that uh, there was another sort of movement happening which was the demand for democratic setup and to quote as an example in countries in many south american countries like uh, ecuador venezuela guatemala etc the military dictatorships were failing for example peru had its very first free elections in 1945 so you know different demands different setup different kind of institutions were gaining importance after the second world war and yes after the world war the main players had to pay their prices as well and one of them was of course as you know germany and the process of denazification was seriously being taken This was an allied initiative to get rid of uh, all the nazi effect from german and austrian society from their culture from their press economy judiciary and politics etc etc and this particular denazification program was uh, actually authenticated or solidified by ports dam agreement and not just germany i think there was another country which was seriously paying some sort of you know fine kind of thing penalty or maybe was japan in japan another you know initiative which was taken after the world war second was the demolition of zaibatsu system well the zaibatsu system it was uh, it's actually a german term sorry japanese term which refers to industrial and financially financial vertically integrated business conglomerates basically high powerful influential people who were deciding uh, the japan's fortune and future so after the world war second because they had lots of influence on the second world war they were trying to be they were being tried to be broken down hiroshima and nagasaki was bombed in august 1945 as per the quebec agreement so this is these are the developments after the second world war also in the field of science and technology we can see a lot of a lot of development um like in the whether you take it whether you take weapon technology atomic energy medicine telecommunication in most of these fields um there were great great developments happening for example um this you know the cruise missile the ballistic missile etc they got prominence during this period and um, the coming up of developing of electronic computers you know the entire technology of radar r- uh, this radar communication and things uh, became more efficient during this time it laid foundation to the modern electronics especially the television and also during the second world war i can say that uh, when we come to know about the mass production of antibiotics especially penicillin etc and also the usage of ddt came into force like you know when they wanted to save their soldiers from getting mosquito bites and all and yes these all things were happening parallelly during the second world war and even after that this race like you know it, it is evident from the space race that happened that followed this war 
So in India also, this demand for a scientifically advanced society was on. Our leaders like Subhash Chandra Bose and uh, Jawaharlal Nehru especially, they really emphasized on the scientific temper and they really kind of promoted scientific advancements. To say that, I can um, we can take an example that Dr. Homi Bhava, who was a very famous nuclear researcher, emphasized that India should be pursuing nuclear research as an advancement. It was on since 1941. So um, just to tell you that in the field of science and technology in 1948 itself, in India parallelly, we set up Atomic Energy Commission under the chairmanship of Dr. Bhava. Well, this is a symbol of that Department of Atomic Energy. I don't know why I put it. Maybe just to increase the artistic value of this slide. <laughs> okay. So, uh, meanwhile, scientific advancement was going on, different kind of processes were going on in different parts of the world. In one part of the world, the struggle for independence was on. As I had mentioned earlier, countries like Indonesia were struggling for its independence from Netherlands from 1945 onwards till 1950. Vietnam was on war against France from 1945 to 1954, and Burma and Salem, Sri Lanka, of course, they become independent in 1948. Meanwhile, let's see what was happening in India. The freedom struggle was on. It was really on. Like, you know, everybody was like, quit India, quit India. And then finally, because British had no way left, they had to leave. So in 1946, the cabinet mission plan was sent and... Yeah, they were accepted with some kind of little bit of heart, bit of feelings. But then, yeah, an interim government was formed. Then the first session of Constituent Assembly was held on 9th December 1946. And the Mountbatten plan, the Dicky Bad plan or something like that, um, of India's partition was announced. And then the Indian Independence Act was passed in 1947 and India got its freedom. Okay, so after getting the freedom, now from the world view, we are getting into an Indian view. We'll see what is happening in India and then we'll go back to the bird's eye view later in this video. Okay, so after the Second World War, India was really facing some, some major challenges. So let's just quickly go uh, look into what exactly those challenges were. The first one was the division of assets between the newly formed Pakistan and uh, India. The next one was the refugee problem that was generated due to partition. The next, of course, the origin of Kashmir issue. Then the foundation of Indian democracy, which was taking its beginner step, like, you know, baby steps. We have already, we have just, you know, finished writing the lengthiest constitution now it's time to put into work and that was a real major challenge and uh, the linguistic reorganization the land of languages was really involved in linguistic reorganization after it got independence you know and of course the britishers had left us with nothing but poverty illiteracy and economic backwardness which was a challenge for the current for the then government to come up so the period from 1947-1960, we are getting into the situations that were in India. The first and the foremost issue that we had to face was integration of the princely state. So the for, um, I think this particular challenge was taken up by Sardar Vallabhai Patel, who along with VP Menon convinced the rulers of princely states which were contiguous, lying contiguous to India, to accede to India. You know, the British India then, it consisted of 17 provinces and 562 princely states. And it was a huge job to get all of these states integrated into, into India. But you know, amidst all these states, there were three states that were really giving trouble time. And the first one among them was Junagadh. Well, this was a Hindu majority state with a Muslim Nawab and I don't know what was going in this Nawab's head. He just wanted to be a part of Pakistan. But people were in support of, of course, India. So there was a plebiscite that happened in December 1947 and people voted. Nearly 99% people voted to merge with India. 
and so it got it became a part of india the second one was the state of hyderabad again a hindu majority state with a muslim nizam and um, yeah they tried to integrate with talks and all here in agri then operation polo happened yeah and uh, end result hyderabad became part of india then the most important state which we really discuss it till now is the state of kashmir well kashmir was not an easy it was not a it was it was really not an easy walk and um, in 1947 there was an outbreak of the first indo pak war over the kashmir issue because you know uh, the pak kashmir signed the instrument of accession and then they said okay fine we'll come with you if you protect us and all that kind of thing anyways in 1949 the indian constituent assembly came up with article 370 which gave special provision for the state of kashmir and kashmir you know got related to india so after all of these events we know that it was not just the only issue that we had to face from the political front we also had another issue which was the issue of linguistic reorganization the demand for states on a linguistic basis had started even before the independence but um, this attained more strength after the initial political integration of provinces and princely states but uh, you know the government was really thinking whether we should reorganize them on the basis of language because they thought it will you know have a potential risk to the unity of the nation and therefore in on june 17th 1948 dr rajendra prasad he set up a linguistic provinces commission known as the thar commission okay so we are chronologically coming up uh, with uh, how the integration happened and now this is something else the linguistic reorganization and in 1948 the thar commission came up with linguistic reorganization and the commission said that the formation of provinces purely on the basis of linguistic concerns is not in the larger interest of the country later the government really got concerned because you know people were simply like give us linguistic countries give us give us linguistic states and all so uh, the congress set up another linguistic commission under jb known as jbp committee and uh, it supported its uh, what do you call it report in 1949 so they they also said that we should not be in favor of you know coming up with uh, this kind of uh, linguistic reorganization and they said this is not happening and there were several leaders who were supporting who were against sorry uh, the linguistic reorganization like nehru k m munshi v k krishna but of course our drafting chairman b r ambedkar he was in support of linguistic organization <laughs> anyways in 1950 after this even after so this linguistic demands are on in 1950 indian constitution comes into effect yay and then in 1951 tan 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 the first amendment is passed um this was an amendment which brought in the ninth schedule okay it is basically considering the agrarian reforms um that uh, this amendment was taken and then um there was in section 31a and article 31b and in 1952 we held our very first general election um it lasted for around 4 months you know from 1951 to 1952 okay so we finished with our general elections so these are the political side of the, the developments in the political side that were happening and um, yes there were a lot of things happening parallelly which we are going to discuss now so we know politically we were facing different kind of challenges but yes we need, we had our economic challenges as well because we as i had said we are we were just out of this bondage and uh, we had huge number of people to take care of we really need a strong economy so that was something which we were really looking into in 1947 india's first finance minister 
ஆர் கே சண்முகம் செட்டி ஹி டேபிள் கண்ட்ரீஸ் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் யூனியன் பட்ஜெட் இன் த பார்லிமெண்ட் ஜஸ்ட் டு ரிமெம்பர் தட் யூனோ வி பிளேஸ் அ ஃபர்ஸ்ட் பட்ஜெட் இன் நைன் ஃபார்ட்டி செவன் இட் செல்ஃப் அண்ட் இன் நைன் ஃபார்ட்டி எயிட் இண்டஸ்ட்ரியல் பாலிசி ரெசல்யூஷன் ஆஃப் நைன்டீன் ஃபார்ட்டி எயிட் திஸ் இஸ் சம்திங் விச் இஸ் இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் டு ரிமெம்பர் இன் த டைம் லைன் இண்டஸ்ட்ரியல் பாலிசி ரெசல்யூஷன் ஓகே ஆஃப் நைன்டீன் ஃபார்ட்டி எயிட் அண்ட் இட் ப்ரோஸ் well we all know about this mixed economy where like you know the the idea of uh, the, this uh, socialistic and the capitalistic come up together so this uh, this idea was really looked on and it envisaged a substantial public sector with state interventions and regulations in order to protect indigenous industries then in the same year we passed the minimum wages act of 1948 well if you talk if we if we look into that we can say that this minimum wages act was something um, you know considering the welfare angle because it uh, had an implication of uh, it implication for both the central and the state governments that um, they would decide the amount of wages paid even before industrialization had started in india and it aimed to set minimum wages that must be paid to skilled and unskilled laborers then the factories act was passed in 1948 again also a welfare measure we can say actually the factories act had started even during the time of lord ripon you know it was from there and kept on reforming but not until 1948 when it was really taken care of it was comprehensively enacted in september 1948 to protect the workers in factories by consolidating and amending the law that regulated the condition of labor in factories then there was this development finance institutions act which was 1948 and the first it was the first financial institution and development bank to be created after the independence which was the industrial finance corporation of india now which is the ifci limited which was formed on 27th march 1948 okay so these are the these are the things well you know before discussing uh, before going on to the next slide i would like to say that this minimum wages act has got a recent amendment uh, considering considering that code of um, wage bill i think you can just go through that and you can get refresh with that current affair as well okay so let's move on continuing with the economic aspects we can say that in 1949 the banking regulations act was passed the reserve bank of india india's uh, central banking authority it was actually established in 1935 but it was nationalized on 1st january 1949 under the terms of rbi reserve bank of india act 1948 and then in 1949 this banking regulation act was enacted which empowered the rbi to regulate control and inspect the banks in india so this was this laid the foundations of banking in india then in 1950 as you know we had suggested this mixed economy kind of stuff we were really taking inspiration from the ussr way of functioning the planning things and all so we set up with we we came up with our planning commission in 1950 actually um after india achieved independence this a formal model of planning was adopted and this was something which was really looked uh, forward as something that would change indian scenario okay so the domestic policies involving the involved with the planning commission was tended towards protectionism with strong emphasis on i would say um what do you call it in the uh, this thing import substitution this was something which we really need to take care of and uh, industrialization economic intervention and all that kind of things and yes government run public sector business regulation central planning and trade and foreign investment policies were relatively liberal but you know not that liberal <laughs> okay so this was what uh, we can say about the planning commission and its setup and then in the year 
we came, it came up with its first five year plan and in the 1951 itself we passed Indian Industries Act now this is something which you need to look because this was to implement that industrial policy if you remember industrial policy resolution of 1948 and this is the period which is marked with the beginning of the license Raj you know yes the British Raj border the license Raj okay so these are the happenings during from the 1947 to 1951 the economic aspects and the kind of developments and the timeline of developments of various economic advancements well we are not yet done let's move on to the next one and in 1952 so I hope you are kind of noting or keeping it in mind that what is happening each year what is the kind of developments okay in 1952 we established Indian Standards Institution okay it was established on 6th January 1947 to operate the certification marks schemes and facilitate the consumer protection so this was the angle it was legalized in 1952 by an act of parliament okay so we can say that an institution was set up in 1952 later it became a legalized a statutory body in 1952 okay so 1947 and uh, it was already there since 1947 but it was legalized in 1952 okay now it has been renamed as bureau of indian standards if you know it then in 1953 we came up with the idea of nationalization of air india that is the parliament voted to nationalize nine airlines the function of the corporations was to provide safe efficient adequate economical and properly coordinated air 92 transport services whether internal or international or both you know as a fun fact to remember the airline um, was actually initially founded by JRD Tata as Tata Airlines in 1932 then the government passed this Air Corporations Act and it purchased its majority stake and then it along with that it also included other uh, airlines and formed this nationalization of Air India then this nationalization process was on in the field of uh, banking as well because in 1955 the nationalization of Imperial Bank forming the State Bank of India happened actually this Imperial Bank was in existence since 1921 through the amalgamation of all the presidency bank in you know the Kolkata Bombay and Madras presidency banks they were amalgamated into Imperial Bank in 1921 and then it was like there but in 1955 this Imperial Bank was uh, changed into what do you call it the State Bank of India the famous State Bank of India okay so after RBI came into force it actually acquired a controlling interest in the Imperial Bank of India and then after the nationalization the State Bank of India came into effect so moving on we know economically many efforts were ongoing with the aim of transforming India and meanwhile let us not forget that our issue of linguistic reorganization had not yet finished okay so we just saw what was happening in the economic field and we had left this linguistic reorganization there with Congress committee JVP committee and now we come back to it in 1953 the first state linguistically formed state the state of Andhra was formed well basically you know it was to protect the interest of Telugu people of Madras state if you know this Porti Sri Ramalu he attempted to force the Madras state government to listen to the public demands uh, you know they want a separate Telugu speaking district so from Madras so they don't want to be part of Madras but you know uh, all the South Indians are still called Madrasis <laughs> jokes apart okay so he went on a lengthy fast and then he only stopped when Prime Minister basically he didn't stop he was stopped by unfortunate death okay so then the Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru promised to form an Andhra, Andhra state okay so in again in 1954 another incident considering 
the political angle was the jammu kashmir state constituent assembly it ratified the accession of kashmir to india well in 1949 we came up with uh, this article 370 and yes jammu kashmir said we officially ratified the accession we are happy okay good enough then in 1955 um, let's go on to next advancement in india which was the setting up of oil and gas division well this is something uh, that comes out of blue you may be thinking here you were just talking about jammu kashmir and suddenly oil and gas came up well that is what i have done sorry for that but yeah oil and gas division this was an effort you know actually after independence um, the central government of india realized the importance of oil and gas for rapid industrial development and its strategic role in defense okay so consequently while framing the industrial policy resolution of of 1948 the development of the petroleum industry in the country was considered to be of the utmost necessity you know why because it it has its great role in industrial development and also in defense so that's why until 1955 private oil companies were mainly working out the exploration of hydrocarbons resources and etc but in 1955 we set up this oil and gas division the oil and natural gas division was set up in october 1955 under the geological survey of india to explore and develop hydrocarbon matlab the government was really worried you know if you give it into private sector we will not get anything so we are taking control so then the same year the division was converted into an oil and natural gas directorate then into a commission and finally after 3 years which is around 19 uh 58 or 59 where it was converted into a statutory body okay so this is how when oil and natural gas division was set up in 1955 it became a statutory body 3 years later then one of the most important legislation considering the welfare angle and also the economic angle was the essential commodities act 1955 i think in the recent budget there was a discussion that this essential commodities act has become obsolete and we should get rid of it and all but yeah let's see it came in 1955 and it had its aim to regulate the production supply and distribution of essential commodities such as drugs oils kerosene coal iron steel and pulses well i'm just reading you can also read it okay so this was another advancement in the field of like legislation you can say economy as well you can say now we move on to the next slide the next event in the timeline was the 7th amendment which was passed in 1956 making paving way for you know the linguistic reorganization of states and all and the next even in 1956 was the second five year plan so as you know in 1951 we had this first five year plan and it uh, uh, it finished its span in by 1956 and we have next we have our second five year plan with a focus on rapid industrialization then again in 1956 we had our another policy of industrial policy resolution 1956 okay so industrial policy revolution 1948 and industrial policy revolution of 1956 according to this industrial policy resolution of 1956 it stated that the state will assume let me take the pen and underline it the state will assume a predominant and direct responsibility i mean you see that yes direct responsibility for setting up new industrial undertakings and they were really serious about it they said that uh, you know there will be a division all at the entire industries will be divided into classified into three types which was oh god this is not going yeah the entire economy will be divided into three points which is industries whose future development will be exclusive responsibility of the states see i think this is important to remember because you never know upsc can come up with some random question based on any of the random things that happen any of the random places in the world so really this can happen i'm sorry yeah so industries that will progressively be state owned and uh, third one was the remaining industry which can be left to the private company i think nothing much was left for the private company during that time 
just for the name sake it was okay so um, this was the condition in the industrial policy resolution 1956 then another major event that had happened in this timeline was the nationalization of life insurance recently we sold the stakes wow okay so in 1956 we nationalized the life insurance this thing and the government national actually there were 154 indian 16 non indian insurers and 75 provident societies which were combined into a single entity forming lic on 1st september 1956 okay so this was all happening and uh, i hope you are keeping track of what was happening in different year we'll go into a birds eye view soon we'll be talking about what was happening in the world soon so stay tuned oh that's rhyming okay so in uh, 1956 so we know what was happening the political scenario till 1956 we know that uh, there was this uh, what do you call it the seventh amendment act was passed states were being reorganized economically we have come up with uh, the second planning uh, this thing and uh, also the industrial policy resolution was on in 1957 this jammu kashmir you know it's walking like a joke and all we call it yeah so 1957 jammu and kashmir approve its own constitution modeled on the lines of india okay then in 1959 something really tricky happens now this is something interesting which you would love to know it was in 1959 the dalai lama escapes to india and um, this really creates problem now let me uh, tell you that this happened during 1959 when the tibetan uprising now this is something which we can remember that is tibetan uprising um if you want to get an information about tibetan uprising i can just simply go through the story to make it a little bit of fun which is that actually um in tibet this uprising happened against the presence of people's republic of china in tibet okay the failure of the armed rebellion uh, like th- there was a crackdown of armed rebellion and basically it failed and because of that dalai lama had to escape he went into exile and um, basically he came to india and this was seen as a trigger for 1962 war not exactly one of the reasons you know it can be said uh, and uh, yeah it is an important event in the history i guess Okay, in nineteen sixty, again the reorganization was on. You know, if you take polity, you will have so many states being formed at different year, and it is important to remember the chronology. You never know when when they ask, like you know, arrange the following in the year they were formed, and all that sort of questions. So, in ways in nineteen sixty, the Bombay state is split along the linguistic lines, forming Maharashtra and Gujarat after a series of violent protests. That is not something new, I guess. Okay. So meanwhile, in 1956, already 14 states had been reorganized based on the States Reorganization Act, 1956. Okay, we move on. So all these things happened. Listening to the Tibetan story, let me remind you that uh, there were other main happenings that we need to remember, which was shaping the course of the current world. And one among this was the formation of Israel. Okay, so we were focusing on what was happening in the world after the World War. we moved into india we discussed a little happenings in india and now we are coming back to the world situation which was an important event in the history which was the formation of the state of israel anyways uh in 1947 the british government referred the question of future of the palestine to the united nations basically what was happening was that there was a huge influx of jews to palestine after this nazis and this holocaust effect everybody was just fleeing and was just coming as refugees into palestine and there was a trouble which and palestine which was under britain and this definitely had problem so british government it referred this to united nations and they said that see there are a lot of people coming you need to really decide about that and then un vote it to split the land into two countries okay jewish people accepted the agreement and declared independence of israel and the state of israel was born in 1948 but this was not at all liked by the arab nations which is like the egypt the jordan iraq in syria and they declared war on israel you get that anyways in 1948 this happened 
just as an information india actually recognized israel in 1950 okay so yeah then another major event that happened parallelly during this time period after 1948 was the korean war which started in 1950 and remained till 1953 this happened when during excuse me it happened during the beginning of the cold war the soviet dispensation backed a communist regime in korean peninsula in the northern region and at the same time the us supported a liberal government in the southern region and naturally this had to happen because this you know the cold war effect was already there in many places this was happening and korea was one among those so the inter korean war lasted for 3 years it was actually a proxy war between us and ussr and you know what india under nehru's active involvement actually even got up with a negotiating um, negotiation uh, and uh, like you know they said that in 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 late 1952 india passed a resolution of korea um in the, at the united nations it, and it was unanimously appoint, uh, supported um basically indian involvement can also be remembered that in 1952 india had passed a resolution on korea and un so you know the 38th parallel later was established dividing north korea with its so called communist regime and the south korea well kim jong un is doing great i guess yeah so the next event which requires and much of a um, you know attention was something that was happening of frothing in china it was the nationalist china leader china's nationalist leader chiang kai shek i think that's how you pronounce it i don't know chiang kai shek anyways establishes an anti communist government on the island of formosa basically that is taiwan now after being defeated on the mainland so let me just tell you what happened uh, basically uh after the second world war the chinese civil war happened okay between chinese nationalist which was led by chiang kai shek and the communist party of india which was led by yes mao zedong throughout the months in 1949 the chinese community party sorry <laughs> chinese communist party it gained control in the chinese mainland which leads to the defeat of the nationalist army and then he had to flee okay the nationalist party evacuates its office and shifts it to taiwan which was then known as the formosa and forming and it formed the republic of china so if you remember there is prc and roc roc is taiwan and prc is the mainland so this was followed by a series of events and eventually roc you know the republic of china in future is you know eventually after a lot of after so many years it loses its un seat and finally prc becomes a sole representative of chinese mainland anyways this is a bit of information you can actually relate it to other events as well there is another issue of this hong kong and macau region which is happening right now like you know that one nation two system or two government kind of thing yes you can remember that here okay so we move on to the world this thing as well uh, like in the political side of the world happenings at the same time we can say that because israel was formed in 1950 israel passes a law of return it said that any jew anywhere in the world can come back you will get automatic citizenship you know and they were welcomed home and just as a matter of fun fact let me tell you uh it was during this 1950s that uh, the soviet union detonates its first hydrogen bomb because it said okay you have atom atomic bomb we have hydrogen bomb we can do anything you know yeah so the and yeah this is something really fun fact that is sir edmund hillary and tenzing norgay if you remember they became the first humans to reach the summit of mount everest like the world was just coming out of the world war and these two people were climbing mount everest that's actually quite impressive yeah so then electricity using atomic power for the first time comes into usage okay so this all these all events are happening during this 1950s okay fine considering the economic expansion 
actually it was considered as a golden age of capitalism post world war II. and also we have to remember another important event or we can say another important institution which should not be forgotten which was the world bank's lending arm ibrd international bank for reconstruction and development it was established in 1945 okay it was first of the five member institutions that composed the world bank group and then in 1956, the second member of the World, group, World Bank Group, IFC, is established as a private sector arm of the World Bank Group to advance economic developments by investing in for profit and uh, commercial projects for poverty reduction and promoting development. Okay. Then, moving on, as I had said, we'll be discussing everything, economy, polity, environment, environmentally at this time during this time there was some major uh, things happening and we can discuss and which was in 1948 IUCN the World Conservation Union or International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources was formed it was founded in 1942 and its headquarter is in Gland Switzerland wow that's Okay, in 1954, the first nuclear power, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, to generate electricity for a power grid war started operations in Soviet Union. In 1956, another important event was the Miramata disease, which was a neurological syndrome that caused that was caused by severe mercury poisoning. See that hand? That looks serious. Okay, so this was. This, these were the major environmental developments that you can kind of remember. Okay, so uh, before we move on to the next part, I hope you are kind of remember, uh, you know, kind of coming up with this entire timeline that had happened and uh, the entire events in India and in the world. I have taken only chosen events so that you know you can you can kind of remember. I think you can keep them as milestones, you know. So that uh, you can relate to what happened before, after, before, after, like that. And if you have points in history um, like this, you can remember the chronology easily. As I had said that we will be discussing certain points which need deeper discussion here. So first among them was the first five year plan. It is important to know few uh, topics or a few points uh, that is important, which is like the first five year plan. It had... It was during the 1951-56. It was based on Harith Domar model. Actually, this was asked in the uh, one of the competitive exams, not in UPSC, but yes, one of the competitive exams. And its main focus was on agricultural development of the country. This plan was successful and it achieved growth rate of 3.6%. See, this is the growth rate. This will be referred to Hindu growth rate in future, as you know it. Because, but but focus on the growth rate in the first five-year plan. The next one was the second five-year plan and it was made for the duration of 1956 to 1961. It was based on PC Mahalanobis model. So this was Harad Dumar model. This was PC Mahalanobis model and its main focus was on the industrial development of the country and this plan was actually successful and it achieved a growth rate of 4.1%. Moving on, another important thing that we need to remember is the Essential Commodities Act, which I had mentioned in 1955, we had passed. This gives consumers protection against irrational spikes in prices of essential commodities. It empowers both central and state governments concurrently. And uh, commodities currently included are drugs, fertilizers, pulses, edible oils, petroleum and petroleum products. This also can be a question because... I think last last year they had asked GST based articles. So, of course, articles including Essential Commodities Act can also come in as a question. Okay, so under the Act, the government can also fix the maximum retail price of any packaged product that it declares as an essential commodity. In September 2019, the Central invoked ECA Act's provision to impose stock limits on onions after the heavy rains. So, this is something which we can just remember. Okay, so I, as I had mentioned, this is the end of the, this entire new video. This is just the beginning. You can suggest any changes that you want. And of course, this is not everything, but 
because you get a timeline as you read as you continue to read you can actually add more points into this timeline kind of thing so if we kind of quickly revise the entire thing we started with 1945 we looked uh, like you know we got an idea what was happening in south america we got an idea what was happening in uh, you know was what what was happening between us and ussr in in germany in japan and what kind of scientific advancements were happening during that time what kind of uh, movements in asia was happening what happened in india and how was india involving in its in its internal matters and also in its external matters how the first indo pak war was was just uh, happened it, it just happened yeah <laughs> it didn't just happen it was a serious matter okay and then about integration of states and our, our initial legislations the the this phenomenon of uh, nationalization all those important things and meanwhile we also discussed about important economic aspects of the country and uh, also of the world and uh, important events in the world like the formation of israel so you know the timeline now okay you can add anything that you read now or you will read in future to this timeline so that it helps you in remembering the entire point so this is me signing off before we end please quickly revise the entire thing if you want to or you can just jot down the important events or the timeline as like a calendar and we'll come up with next span next uh, period of year and we'll have another yet another analysis of this parallel study so thank you have a nice day